So a special case of the cash flow diagrams that we were looking at uh, is one where you have a number of cash flows that happen at uniform amounts for a specified period of time. So the same amount happens over a period of time. So the way that that uh, may look is something like this. You have a number of periods over time. Um, and let's actually look at, at the case where, you know, over this, these number of periods, you actually are, um, you know, let's say that you are having to uh, deposit into a bank account. So this would actually be from the perspective of the bank account, right? It's these deposits into the bank account. Okay. And there's a reason why I'm starting here at, at uh, one, right? Rather than at zero. Okay. And then after having deposited this same amount each time, okay? So let's actually, I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and put a number to it. Let's say that this is a uh, hundred bucks each time. Say you're saving up for something, right? So you say every month I'm going to put a hundred bucks into my bank account. Okay. And then after all of this time, I am going to make a withdrawal from my bank account. Okay. So this is a little bit different because we're not even bringing the wallet into this at all. Now what we're doing is we're looking at the bank account as being the storage device, right? Uh, so, Anyway, but this is, let's, let's say we're doing this and we have to figure out how much could we withdraw at the end if this is what we had been saving. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I'll say, what if those are months? Let's say, what, what interest rate do you want for this period of time? 3%. Okay, 3%. Let's say we have 3% annual interest. Okay, and you're going to compound it monthly. Okay, and what you want to know is how much can you take out at the end if this is how you've been saving? And based on what we just did, what would you have to do to, to calculate this? Okay, you do one at a time. You'd basically say that you would have a hundred, okay, this would be your, what you could have as your future value would have a hundred times one plus, okay, now what we need to do is look at that 3%, but we're doing this, these are months down here, I said, right? Okay, so how do I deal with that? Okay, so we have this 3%, 0.03 over 12, that gives me my monthly interest rate. And then what do I do? Okay, he says the power of four, and that's the reason he's saying it is that there are four time frames, you know, four periods between that cash flow of 100 bucks and now. What else will I have? So that's that's power of four. So plus 100 times. 1 plus 3% over 12 raised to the third plus 100 times 1 plus 3% over 12 raised to the second, okay, plus 100 times 1 plus 3% over 12 raised to the first power. And then finally, 100 times 1 plus 3% over 12 raised to what? Zero. Okay, so we basically, those five terms allow us to take care of each of those cash flows and we can figure out how much will we have there at the end. Okay. To make sure that we're, you know, doing this correctly, the, uh, what we need to do is make sure, you know, 
that we have consistent units that we're applying. So in this case, we have a monthly interest rate that we create by dividing our annual interest rate by 12. The question there is, is our exponent then in months, since we have a monthly interest rate that we've now created by dividing by 12? Yes, right, because this is, we're actually, the whole thing lasts less than one year, right? It's just five months of savings, oh, right. right? So, right, so, you know, just be very careful, look at it carefully and make sure you're matching consistently that the time units that you have in your exponent yeah. are the same as the basis of your uh, interest rate, okay? Well, uh, I wanna show you something that you're probably gonna like. Okay. Well, before I show you anything else, let me actually show you that there's another reason why you might like your calculator. Okay. Most of you have probably seen a, for, a summation uh, construct like this somewhere in your math stuff that you have done. We can do this. Okay. What would our formula look like if we're going to do a sum? First of all, the amount is 100 bucks, right? So that's easy. Okay. Every one of them has 1 plus uh, 0.03 over 12, right? Okay, so that doesn't change for any of the terms. What is the thing that does change? Okay, we could take this to a power of a variable. Okay x and then as long as we pick the right limits for our sum here what do our limits have to be okay it has to start at zero and go to four okay and that'll tell us how much we will have at the end we didn't earn a bunch of interest right but we you know we earned a little bit there 502 51 Okay. Now, not everyone has that calculator uh, or the, the TI equivalent. Um, if you don't have that, that's a lot of typing, right, to get all of that put in there. And there's a good chance you could mess something up as you're typing it all in. So there is actually a, uh, an interesting thing that we can do for these uniform series to try to take what we did there and turn it into something that's a little bit easier to use than having to manually go through and type in each of these terms, which isn't as bad if you have a summation function on your calculator, but it would be nice for us to go ahead and solidify that into a, an actual formula. So let's do that. Let's do it kind of like we did whenever we first looked at compounding interest. Let's take a couple of examples. So first of all, let's say that this is our basic uh, cash flow diagram. I'll draw it over here. So a basic cash flow diagram is that we're going to start with nothing at zero, but then we will start in, in year one, okay, and we'll start depositing these amounts, okay, and I'll tell you what, we'll start with uh, three deposits, and then at the end of that, we will make a withdrawal the question is, if these are each A, okay, and uh, we have an interest rate of I per period, and these are our periods, one, two, and three, the question is, how much can we withdraw? Just kind of like a future value. All right, well, let's actually start, you know, figuring that out. So we, we say uh, the deposit that happened at the end of year three, okay? What is that one gonna be worth? Okay, so, you know, period three deposit. What is that one worth at the end? A, All right, did it have any time to accumulate interest? The one I'm referring to is this one right here. Did it have time, any time to accumulate interest? Okay, what about the period two deposit? Okay, 
So that one did have time to earn interest. And how much will it be worth there at the end? Raised to the first power, right? Okay. What about in, uh, in one? Okay. A times one plus I to the second. Okay. And then did we have anything in zero? No. Okay. So let's actually expand these out. So this is actually A. This is A times 1 plus i, and this is a times 1 plus 2i plus i squared. Okay, and if I add all of these up, that gives me my amount at the end, correct? Okay, so when we add these up, a is just this factor out here, so we really can just sort of add up, this is a times 1, right? We can really just add up, since the A is in all of them, we can add up the stuff that's in the parentheses. Do you agree with that? So I should be able to do this. A times what? 3 plus 3i plus i squared. Interesting. Interesting. Let's change it up just a little bit. So that we start looking at that, we go, I might be seeing a pattern there, but I'm not sure. Let's go to four. Okay, let's change this problem. Let's say we'll go one more period. There are no problems. Yeah. Zero No one saw anything. All right, so we, we extend this by one more period, okay? And what do we have now? Okay, what we actually have is that we can slide all of this down. We extended this by one more period, so we're going out to four now. And we're going to take all of these. All right, I tell you what I'm going to do. I am not going to try to slide these at all. I'm going to erase them. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to write in new numbers over here. We are going to put, this is four, this is three, this is two, and now what do we need to do? Okay, we probably need to, instead of um, coming up with this result here at the end, what do we need to do? We need to add a one, and what happens for one? Okay, if we expand that 1 plus i to the third, what do we find? 1 plus 3i plus 3i squared plus i cubed. Okay, so now let's, let's add these up. Okay, <clears throat> and what we end up with there is we have a times 4 plus what? Plus 6i plus 4i squared plus i cubed. Okay, and remember, what was our last one when we, when we ended here? What did we end up with? a times 3 plus 3i, right, plus i squared. Do you start seeing the beginnings of something of a pattern? Okay, here's the problem. We don't have the whole pattern, right? Some of you are looking at those and saying, I see a pattern that looks like binomial theorem, but it's not quite right to actually be the, the binomial theorem, right? Uh, as we saw in, the, in our previous lecture. So uh, what do we do about it? Okay, and this is, by the way, this is our future value. Here's what we can do about it. If it doesn't look exactly like we want it, let's manipulate it in some ways that we know aren't wrong. Okay? We're not sure they're right, but we know they're not wrong. 
Okay? So we're going to manipulate this a little bit. And the first thing we will do is we are going to add and subtract, excuse me, we're going to multiply and divide. This is the first thing we're going to do. Multiply and divide by i. Okay? So what I'll do basically is say this is going to be a times 4i plus 6i squared plus 4i cubed plus i to the fourth over i. Is that legal? Okay. So all I did is I multiplied and divided by i. Okay. Next, what I'm going to do is add and subtract 1. So here what I'll do is I'll say we have a, okay. How do I do this? Okay. Right. So basically, what we say here is that if we add and subtract um, right in the same place, then you know we get away with this, right? So one way of looking at it actually is put a down here. Is it okay for me to write this as uh, one plus four uh, i plus six i squared plus four i cubed plus i to the fourth minus one? over i, because we still have that that still lingers on, OK? Well, now, what have I made here? OK? If you, if you recognize that, that becomes um, just 1 plus i raised to what power? The fourth power, OK? So this says that f is equal to a times 1 plus i raised to the fourth power minus 1 over i. Okay. If I had gone through that whole process up here, remember this is what we had before, what would this look like? Could I multiply and divide by i? Okay. So that would basically be i over here over i. And that gives me what? That would be a times, okay, this would be uh, 3i plus 3i squared plus i cubed over i. And then what would I do? If you add and subtract 1, you would end up with a times, and I'll just cut to the chase, it'll be a times 1 plus i to the third power minus 1 over i. So do we see a pattern? Yes. Okay, we do. And that pattern continues to hold if you keep on adding more periods that you do this. So basically, what this tells us is that we have f is going to be equal to a times 1 plus i to the n minus 1 over i. This only holds if a is constant. Okay. Uh, this is if you have constant amounts. That's right. That A is a constant value each time that you put it in there. Okay? So this is probably a good idea when we write this up here to go ahead and also put our cash flow diagram, right? Make sure that we understand all the details about the cash flow diagram. The first thing to note, there are no cash flows for this equation that happen in the, you know, like right now, right? The, the assumption is that the first cash flow happens at the end of that first segment, or the beginning of the, of the number one, right? So that would be where it begins. It continues on at that same level of A each time. So in the next one, you'd also have a, uh, a value of A, okay, in that second one. And then... You know, you can expand that out for however long you want, out to n. And you do have a cash flow of A in that last one as well. And that's where you can pull out your value of F. 
Okay, so this is uh, a formula that's extremely handy for us to, to have. Questions yet at this point? Okay. What's the problem with including zero? Say what now? If we were to include zero. If you were to include one at zero, what should you do? Yeah, you could shift over everything one, right? You could actually turn your zero into one, okay. right? If you wanted to have one right there at the very beginning, you might have to shift your viewpoint on what your time frame is, okay? A bigger question might be what happens, so this is, this is a good uh, example of if you are saving up for something over time, right? That was the example I did right up here. You're, uh, you're saving up 100 bucks a month over these five months, and you, know, you want to know how much have you accumulated over that period of time. Often what we want to know is how big a loan or how big a payment am I going to have, for instance, if I get a loan of a certain amount, which is a present value, right? So the question there is, how can I change this formula so that I end up with a present value? Okay, what do you think? Do we have a formula that relates future value to present value? Okay, so since we have that, what we can do is actually just do a substitution and say here then that for this formula, we have P times one plus I to the N is equal to A times one plus I to the N minus one over I and what that ends up meaning is that P is equal to A times one plus I to the N minus one over I times one plus I. To the N, thank you. Okay, so what does this cash flow diagram look like for that formula? Does it look kind of similar? Here, here's kind of what it looks like, right? You have a timeline. What happens here is uh, like you might need money right now, right? So you receive money, but then what happens? You have to pay it back in little bits over time, okay? Again, there could be a gap in these number of times that you have to pay back, right, out to the nth time. So this is zero, one, two. Each of these is A. And what you get out is this present value. That's what you get right at the beginning. Okay, so um, this is kind of like a savings account. This is kind of like a loan. And, and uh, this right here is almost exactly what your mortgage will be like whenever you get one. Okay, it'll most likely be compounded monthly, um, but that is basically at its most fundamental level how a mortgage works. It's usually how car payments work as well. Okay, well, should we do a problem? Yeah. All right, let's do this problem. You just came to college, okay? And your parents didn't buy you a car, okay? Mine didn't either, okay? So you're at college and you want a car. You want a $5,000 car. You're not asking for much. Okay, your parents aren't gonna buy it for you. You don't have the $5,000. You're thinking about taking out a loan. Okay, have you all looked into how much loans cost? Okay, what's, what's a typical interest rate for, for uh, purchasing a car? What's that? Too much, okay? I've seen 6%. If, if no one has any 
you know, quarrels with that, I'll say, let's say that uh, you shop around, you find a 6% interest rate. Okay. How long do you want to be paying on your car? Okay, there's a lot of times there's like three-year loans. Sometimes there's four-year loans for car loans. Okay, um, what do you want to do? Let's, say, let's actually say it's four years. We'll do a four-year loan. Okay, this is an annual interest rate. Okay, we'll do a four-year loan compounded. What do you want to say? Monthly. Buy fortnightly. Okay, four-year loan compounded monthly. Okay. So, and what you want to know is how much is your payment going to be? Okay. So what's interesting here is we're solving the problem here, not where we're trying to find P, right? We know P. What's P? $5,000. What we're we trying to find here? Yeah, we're trying to find A. That's that payment amount of A. So what, one of the things that might be helpful to us here is to actually take this formula and rearrange it slightly. What if you solve this formula for A? Yeah, it's not tricky. You just flip the fraction, right? So you just say this is going to be equal to P times I uh, times 1 plus I to the N over 1 plus I to the N minus 1. Okay. So what do we put in here? A will be equal to what? $5,000 times, okay, 6%. Good question here is though, how are we compounding? So we really need a monthly interest rate, right? Then what? Okay, 1 plus 0 0.06 divided by 12. Okay. And we're talking about four years, which is 48 months, right? So you can either do that as 4 times 12 up here to kind of remember that you're going to monthly instead of annually. Or you can just put in 48 if you feel comfortable just putting that in directly. All right. What about in the denominator? 1 plus... 0.06 over 12, raised again to the 4 times 12, minus 1. And what is your payment going to be? Okay, we will have 5,000 times, there's a fraction here, I'll actually put in another fraction of 0.06 over 12 times 1 plus 0 0.06 over 12. Okay, that gets going to get raised to the 4 times 12. Okay, then in the denominator we put uh, 1 plus a fraction again, 0 0.06 over 12. and that will be raised to the 4 times 12, then what? Minus 1. So if you can swing $117.43 or so a month, then you can at least make your car payment. Of course, that doesn't buy you gas. That doesn't buy you repairs right? doesn't buy you tires, insurance, right? But you can at least afford to make the purchase of your car.
All right. Well, let's solve a different problem now. Let's actually say that you're again, you're going to say, you know what? I don't necessarily need a car right now. You know, I've got friends that have cars. You know, uh, if I need to go to Walmart, there's a Walmart just right over across the road. I can walk over there, right? There's not really a big reason I need a car. And so I'm going to forego having a car for four years. And instead of buying the car now, I'm going to plan on buying a $5,000 car when I get out of college because that's a point in time where I feel like I'm really going to need it. Okay? So again, $5,000 car. We'll say, what kind of interest rate do you think you can get if you just save your money? Okay. $5,000. Okay. We'll talk about, someone says 2% interest rate. I think you might be able to do a little bit better than that. Let's call, let's call it 3%. Okay. 3% interest rate. Okay, so now this was up here, this was a loan. This is now a savings idea. Okay, we're gonna do four years of savings. Okay, how much do you have to save each month? To buy the car. Just straight up buy your $5,000 car. Okay. How does this change? Yeah, so we're looking at a future value kind of a problem here, right? Because you're trying to figure out how much will you have at the end after having saved a certain amount each period, okay? And so again, though, we're trying to find A, so what we're trying to do is take this uh, formula that I have up here and rearrange it. Well, stuff's not really working real well today, so we'll just go ahead and rewrite it. What is F? It's A times one plus i to the n minus one over i. Okay, if we rearrange this where we solve for a, it gives us f times what? i over one plus i to the n minus one. Okay, how much do we have to save each month to be able to buy the car? <clears throat> Okay, again, it's $5,000. Up here, we will take 3%. Of course, we want that as a monthly uh, because that's the way a lot, of, uh, a lot of savings accounts compound. So here we've got uh, 1 plus 3% over 12 raised to the what? Again, four times 12, right? 48 months worth of savings while you're in school. Minus one. All right, so 5,000 times 0.03 over 12. Then we have one plus 0.03 over 12 raised to the 4 times 12 minus 1. Okay. So if you can save $98.17 a month over 4 years, then you can afford to buy this $5,000 car whenever you get out of school. Okay? 
So my question here is this. So this is kind of a bigger question. Which side of this coin would you like to be on? In life. Okay. So my point with this is, is this, right? In either case, you're getting a $5,000 car. You had to go through four years of your life where you didn't have a car, right? The other option you have is you could buy something that was way cheaper to get you by for those first four years, all right? My first few cars I bought um, were in the neighborhood of about $1,000 each, right? So... What's that? Cars. Well, kind of. Actually, you know, I, I like working on cars. So my first car was a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. And I, I restored it, you know, so that it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and it taught me a lot as well. But, you know, it didn't have to cost me a whole lot of money, right, to, to have that vehicle. And so that gave me transportation in the early part of my life. And then, you know, as, as time goes on, if you stock away some money, uh, in every one of the times you get a paycheck and you decide that is how I have a car payment. Instead of having a car payment that it's a loan, I sort of have a car payment that is a storage of resources to the point where I need them. Right? And it costs you a lot less and once you get into that cycle in your life, it continues to cost you a lot less and you are not living any lower quality of life. Right? You can still have the same sort of value of vehicle and you know, by doing it from the savings end rather than from the loan end, it helps you out, okay? So that's, that's kind of my, I just wanted to illustrate that just a little bit, because what's the, I mean, that's a pretty big difference in, if you think of percentages, right? And these are not ridiculous numbers, right? They're, they're, these are all relatively reasonable numbers that I have up here for this problem. It's like 20 plus a month, that difference. Right. It's about 48. Sure. All right, any other questions? So that is the idea of uh, uniform uh, amounts that you apply each period and how that accumulates over time, present or future value um, for that type of a cash flow. All right, awesome, appreciate it.